Good morning, podcast. Welcome to a new episode today. I have Eric Flaberg with me, a Chicago-based photographer. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Pierre. Eric, can you share with the audience, with everyone listening here, what you're known for in Chicago and in the world in general? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so I do photography and a bit of filmmaking. Um, yeah, I specialize in, in portraiture and shooting weddings. Um, Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people know me just kind of for my creative approach towards portraiture. Um, I'm really prone to use a, a tilt shift lens from uh, now and then and uh, working with multiple exposures in my digital images. Um, yeah, my approach to wedding filmmaking is a bit more nuanced and, uh, and creative. Uh, and I just fired up a, a YouTube channel this year and seen um, some steady growth. But, uh, you know, being the wedding season, it's pretty impossible to upload regularly <laughs> uh but yeah that's kind of where i'm at what i like to do and a bit of glints uh, into into my creative life that's awesome so guys i want i want to give you a little bit of context the reason i made eric come on the podcast is because first of all his work looks beautiful so eric your instagram is eric.floberg hmm. yep yeah so f-l-o-b-e-r-g Uh, on Instagram, so go check him out. But mainly it's because you're a photographer working full time with clients for weddings. You're doing also a bit of video and you just got into the YouTube scene. So I think your vision, like where you're at right now, is very interesting because I want to talk about gear. I want to talk about uh, getting some money from your photography. So I think you're the best person to talk to right now because this is your full time job. It's not just something you're doing on the side for yep. fun. Cool. All right. So we've got some questions from my audience, Eric. Yeah. And after that, we'll, uh, we'll discuss a little bit more about your YouTube channel and, uh, and, the next, uh, and the next adventures with that, because I think everyone here listening is going to be interested. Too. Cool. So the first question that we have is from... Where did this guy go? I like your sound effects. All right. So the... <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, you know what? Deep down inside, I've always wanted to be a sound effect make uh, maker. You know, with uh -huh. the so whenever I I film transitions, if you ever pick it up on the uh -huh. video, sometimes the sound effect is is from me. Nice. So yeah, like transition, you know? Yep, yep. <laughs> what? <laughs> anyway, awesome. uh, don't don't do that at a at a wedding. <laughs> 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 All right, so Maxi Wegner is asking. What lens do you use the more in photography? Is it 1635, 70-200 or prime lenses? So I think, Eric, I, I want to hear you because I want to hear what you, what you shoot the most with for photography when you do weddings and then for video. Yeah. Um, so I don't own a zoom lens at all. I shoot entirely. Yeah, what? I shoot entirely on primes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I think that kind of differentiates me um, from the crowd a bit. Uh, I like shooting primes, especially for portraiture, because of the depth of field I can achieve. Um, you know, I, I like to take advantage of uh, my full frame sensor and really maximize depth of field and um, sharpness on a subject. Uh, I see it as being really versatile in uh, settings with having lower light. Um, now we have cameras that are, you know, really um, able to work with low light, but uh, adding a low aperture is um, it's just really helpful in those situations to be versatile, um, to be still be able to capture stuff in really dark situations. Um, but more than anything, the prime lenses, uh, I think they force me to not be comfortable in, uh, in mm. creating stuff. So it forces me to move my body. It forces me to recompose in a way that's not going to make me stand still and stand in a corner. Um, and that goes for both photography and filmmaking. Uh, yeah, and so just the versatility of being able to have that uh, low light capability, the shallow depth of field, and then forcing me to be creative by moving my, myself are the biggest reasons why I shoot with primes. Wow. So even for the video, it's only primes? All primes. Yep. Damn, that's, that one is more tough because... Definitely. I mean, with the zoom lens, you can get like some cool effects when you mm -hmm. uh, zoom in and out. Yeah. That's so interesting. And you, you never felt limited? Oh, no. Yeah. I, it, uh, 
I've integrated in it into my style uh, completely. I don't, I don't really okay. do any zooming effects when I film. And if I ever want something like that, I just do it in post and um, don't care about the resolution. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I run around with, uh, you know, if I'm filming, I run around with my camera, mm -hmm. usually on a stabilizer or a monopod, and I'm carrying a shoulder bag with different primes in it. So it's not, it's not that I don't have access to longer focal lengths or wider focal lengths. Um, but it's, it, it is a bit more cumbersome to have to lug that stuff around, but for the reasons I said, I prefer it. So. Oh, got it. That is so interesting. So wait, um, for anyone listening right now, I want you to let us know, maybe go head over to Instagram or YouTube and let us know, do you shoot mainly prime or do you use zoom lenses? Uh, Eric, I'm sure, you know, I use some, I only use zooms yeah. right now. <laughs> Um, but I, I have another question. What are your go-to primes? Like if you have only two for the day, what, which ones? Uh, that's a, that's a really difficult question for me because some of my most creative portraits are made with my tilt shift lens. I have a 45 millimeter, uh, F 2.8, the Canon. And that is possibly my favorite lens, but Uh, it's tough because I only use it about five to 10% of any shoot. So um, if, if that was the differentiating factor, I would probably choose that one. And then that makes it really tough for me because this, this question I, I always want to answer with three lenses. <laughs> if, if I could, if Got I could it. do three, uh, it's, it's a problem for me. I have a really hard time. Okay. Just... Give, give me, give me okay. three. Give me so three. I would go with my 35 prime F 1.4. I'd go with my 45 yep. uh, tilt shift 2.8 and my 85 prime 1.2. So basically, Eric, your three uh, lenses are 35, 1, 4, 45. The, the tilt shift is so interesting. And I think that really makes your style unique mm -hmm. when you shoot. And I'm sure clients tell you, I want that kind of shot. No? Yeah. Um, it's actually a really good litmus test for me to see like if a client fits or not, because yeah. sometimes clients will be like, that looks amazing. I want that. Or I'll get a potential client that's like, Hey, I've seen those photos where like you blur out people's legs. Can we like not have that? And that's a, that's a red, that's a red flag for me. I'm like, Oh yeah, we're not a good fit. See ya. Um, okay. So usually I can kind of steer those people away just because I don't ever want people to like, you know, certain act of my specific art form. Um, yeah, you don't like, want don't, them to treat you as a commodity. Yeah, I don't need yeah. to. I don't need to limit my range of creativity to fit their needs. It mm -hmm. would just be much easier if they just went with someone else to, to fit their needs. Got it. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yep, um, yep. It's interesting. I'm gonna answer that question too because so uh, guys, if you're listening and if you're hesitating about lenses, I just want to give a heads up and maybe. Eric, you can say something about it. But personally, when I was shooting couples, when I was shooting weddings, even when I was traveling, I have always loved prime lenses because as you're saying, it gets you to move and try different approaches and be a bit more creative with one set frame, which is interesting mm -hmm. because that's what we were talking in the previous podcast with ben Benjamin Yavaski, and he was saying whenever he has, he's losing inspiration, he just put constraints Uh, yep. or limits on on something and then it just sparks new ideas yeah. so uh, uh, that's why i love prime lenses now if you're hesitating between the um, original brands like canon and icon or sigma and stuff and i know i'm i'm saying that because a lot of people ask me uh there is no difference most of the time to be honest the new like third party lenses are really amazing so if you get mm -hmm. rubber Uh, Sigma 3514, that was one of my favorite lens. It's, it's really nice. To get to the point to what I'm using, I'm only using 1635 and 7200. Um, they are both 2.8 lenses. They are both super expensive, but it allows me to carry only two lenses when I'm traveling. Now, if I had to do it again, guys, I would drop, and Eric, I would drop the 7200 mm -hmm. right now. And keep only your 85.14 or 85.18. Yep. Um, yep. It's super heavy, the 7200. I really mm -hmm. love it. Like, there is no doubt. I love that lens. But I think I, I would have the 85. It would be easier. And also, when you're doing street photography, I mean, Chicago is fairly 
I, I don't want to say safe, but I don't feel in danger when I'm in the streets uh, downtown. Mm -hmm. But in certain countries, when you're with the 7200, and maybe that's mo worth more than like five years of their salary, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's always a bit iffy. <laughs> If I had to choose, I would keep the 1635 because when I shoot vlog style videos, I need to be wide. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would have just the 24 millimeter, I think, mm -hmm. or 24 and 85, or mm -hmm. 35 and 85. And then I would be good. Now we've got the next question. And this is from Miles and Miles. So thank you so much for your question. The question, Eric, is going to be great. I think I'm going to let you go first too. It is, could you discuss how you took photography from a hobby to a job where you actually made it a full-time living? Yeah. So um, it's kind of funny how I got into the industry. Uh, it all started in, in seventh grade. Um, with a, a Spanish project. Uh, we made a video, silly video, me and some friends. And uh, my friend knew how to edit videos in Windows Movie Maker. And I Windows was, <laughs> oh yeah, classic. Uh, I was just enthralled with his abilities to create audio, splice stuff together. I was, I was just enamored by it. So we presented and everybody else in the class was ashamed to present uh, after we, Uh, played our video and <laughs> no they, way they asked the you teacher were that kind of guy <laughs> yeah they uh they asked everybody asked the teacher if they uh could get a b on the project and not have to present and uh she obliged and said all right yeah i'll give everybody a b uh and so from that point on i had to make the best video in every class i made a video on uh from that point on in my school career so um all the way through junior high and high school i uh i was filming and making uh, videos for school and that mm -hmm. kind of translated in, uh, throughout college, uh, making different videos throughout college until finally one summer in 2011, a high school friend said her sister was getting married and she was asking me if I wanted to film it. So I filmed it for 300 bucks and fell in love with it. And long story short, from that point on, it just kind of snowballed. I went to school for, uh, for teaching. Uh, I was a teacher for three years from 2013 to 2016 while growing oh, my business. You were a teacher. Yeah. So I was teaching full time and growing my business on the side, which honestly, I'm a huge advocate of. I think growing small businesses debt free while working another job is a really, really good way to go. Um, just helps you, yeah. to, helps you to acquire all of your gear, all of your overhead without having to take out a loan. Um, just kind of sets you up for success. So when you get to the point of, being able to shoot full time and drop that other job, you can do so pretty easily. And, um, and then you can just hit the ground running full time. So as of uh, June, 2016, I've been full time with my business. So it's been a little bit over two years, but uh, yeah, I've been, I've been shooting on a professional level for, you know, over five years at this point. That's so interesting. Now you got me curious. So your first ones were like weddings from friends of friends. Yeah. So you always started with weddings or did you, or did you like start picking up like anything? Yeah, it was mostly weddings as I grew uh, my business. That was my, my cash cow. Um, and since I was teaching full time and doing another job, I wasn't really pursuing any other avenue with photography or filmmaking. Um, while I was teaching, I had it in my head that I'd probably be teaching for 10 years while I grew this business. Uh, but it's, yeah. it snowballed so fast that, Um, I was able to, to leave pretty early. Um, after two years of teaching, my wife and I actually considered jumping full time. Um, we had our first kids, so I ended up taking a third year for health insurance and a little bit uh, more cash. But that year yeah. proved to be a disaster because it was teaching full time and shooting 25 weddings. And uh, it was definitely one of the toughest years of my life. Um, just literally couldn't do anything other than work. So. That sounds like a marathon, but for one year. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And sometimes that's what it takes. Sometimes it takes that season of being really uncomfortable to then all of a sudden, because when June came around in 2016, uh, it was one of the, like the most freeing moments of my life. Just uh, being able to exclusively work on my business, exclusively work on my art and uh, commit all of my time to it uh, so that it's just been so exciting ever since then. That's awesome. Yeah, I can share the feeling. I, I'm curious, 
when um, when you were starting and you were starting to charge people, what made you think or was there something that made you think I can charge this amount of money for my work? How did you get to that point and what what was the key element you would say? So at first, I felt really weird raising my prices. I didn't feel like my work had as much value as people were paying. Um, so I, I, for, for the first two, three years, I kept my prices really low and just tried to book a good amount of work to, to get a portfolio. Like how low? Give us, give us a number. Oh, man. So I shot my first one at $300. The next wedding film I did was probably seven or $800. Um, and then into my first few years of photography I was shooting weddings for 1200 1500 um, with the amount of work that I was putting into it and the amount of overhead I was accruing with my gear I was basically breaking even I was depending on my full-time job to actually get money wow. home um, but I was using all these jobs to uh, to get all my overhead to 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 get quality reliable gear Uh, insurance, computer, all that stuff. Um, yeah. So it wasn't until I felt like I had bargaining power where my skills started to get pretty good and my style started to uh, come into play where I felt like I could start charging more. And also just uh, you have more bargaining power once you start getting more jobs. It's like, okay, well, I have 20 weddings booked this year. I don't necessarily need to book any more. So I'm going to raise my prices And if people don't want to pay that, that's fine. I'm set. But if they do, that's just more money in the bank for me. And I can use that to grow the business more and to profit. So that's really good. Yeah. That, that's that's that. Yeah, that totally makes sense. It's like, okay, people are booking. So it means it's, it's the price is already either too cheap or right. Yeah. Let's increase it and see if it's wrong. If you increase it or if it's still right. Yep. That's interesting. Um, I, I'm curious, were you looking at other videographers and comparing your work thinking maybe oh this guy does that he charges that much which means my work's just as good or i'm not there yet i cannot charge that x what do you, yeah. what was your yeah i i would do that frequently um but i think a lot of people i think a lot of people are kind of a lone wolf in this situation they they look at their work and they go oh i can only charge that much it's not it's not smart to charge anything more Um, I'm not worth that. Uh, it wasn't until it wasn't until I got connected to the community of photographers and filmmakers in Chicago where I started to recognize my worth um, on a, a, a larger scale. Um, when uh -huh. I started seeing people who were more established in their business charging what they were charging and seeing what they were um, producing, I was like, oh, man. Okay, yeah, yeah. My, my, my stuff is better than that, and I'm charging half, and I need to raise my prices. And they were encouraging me to do the same. Like, yeah, you definitely need to raise your prices. And so every year in, in the first five that I was shooting, I would book half of my weddings for the next season. So once I got to, like, 12, 15 weddings, I would raise my prices, like, a clear 500 to 1,000 per package. Um, and then the rest of the year, I would still book out – I would – book about 12 to 15 more after that and i was surprised oh every God. single time i was like why didn't i raise these earlier <laughs> um it's but it's perceived value by your client and the way i always look at it it's 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 great uh in america just because uh it's a consensual relationship between you and your client they see the value of your work and if they're willing to pay what you're asking they'll do it and it's not like it's not yeah. like you're pulling their arm and um you know pulling their teeth and trying to get them to pay that they look at your pricing. They look at their work and your work. And if they see the value, they're going to pull the trigger and pay for you. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a delicate balance of just seeing your value, understanding what you already have insured for your next year. Um, and I guess it's kind of taking a gamble on raising the prices, but every year for me, it's, it's been, it's proven to, to be a good move to, Um, raise those, those prices halfway through. So. That's yeah. awesome. So I want to, uh, I just want to give you guys a heads up, you guys listening. Uh, obviously, I'm asking a lot more questions than the three right now because I think that subject's super interesting and we could talk a lot more. So I was just, I'm just trying to, um, 
how do you call elaborate? That? No, yeah, or like anticipate, anticipate. So I'm just trying to anticipate you might you get there are still right. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> So I'm just trying to anticipate your questions, guys. So that's why I was asking a little bit more. I can give you a super quick run through about my story, but most, most of you already know it. If you don't know it, I used to be an engineer in oil and gas. Eric, maybe you don't know that. Um, and one day, well, I was always interested in photography, but just, just more as fun and travel related mm -hmm. than pro anything professional. But then I, I was starting to get really bored in my job and I was really into the idea of creating something for myself that would actually bring revenue also. Mm -hmm. And that's when I decided that I would explore different options. And one of them was being, becoming a photographer. Now, if you want the full story, I have a link maybe in the, in the bio, in the description of that podcast. And I'm sending out the full story with details of how I made it and stuff. It, it, I think it's very interesting if you want to receive that in an email. But long story short, I, I started becoming a photographer just like you in parallel of becoming an engineer. And I looked at what other people were doing in the space. I, was, I used to be a portrait and wedding photographer. Um, in Paris, I looked at what other people were charging and I would literally would compare my work to their work mm -hmm. and ask other people to compare it. And as long as I wasn't up to that, that standard, I would not charge people because I didn't want to charge $50 for a section or $100, $150. I wanted to go straight to the real money. And since I had a full paying job on the side, it didn't really matter. I would shoot all my friends until I would get to that level. Mm -hmm. And once I got to that level, I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's find people. And then I started running a few ads and I, and I got people in the door and after word of mouth, uh, started uh, picking up and yeah it was really it was really good now the difference between you and me uh, Eric is that uh, your clients are all in Chicago but mo my clients were all coming from abroad mm -hmm. <laughs> so which is slightly more difficult for word of mouth yeah. because um, yeah that's the only thing so you, you need a little bit more marketing strategies but if you guys are interested hit us up with questions about that we could discuss that uh, I think Facebook ads, for example, is a, is a great way to, uh, to get a foot in the door. If you've never had a paid gig in your life and you're trying to work with private clients, you can do a lot of things on that scene and it's still uh, relatively cheap. So that's, um, that's a good uh, angle. But as you guys know, after that, I completely moved away from portrait and weddings. Not that I didn't like it, uh, but simply I wanted to go back towards something I love more, which was travel and adventure photography. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and over the past year and a half, I've really tried to go deeper into that. So um, it's a drone-in process. It's not fully paying right now. I, if I had to get, make money with my camera, I would go back to shoot people like instantly, mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if I'm honest. Yeah. It, it's, um, yeah, it's a bit more difficult, but I'm... It's, I don't know if it's more difficult. It, it takes a little bit more time, but I think I'm getting there. And it's a totally different avenue that I never anticipated before mm -hmm. either. Meaning it's not so much working with people. It's one side working with brand, brands. And another side is working with enthusiasts about photography who want to come with you on workshops or who want to shoot in places or want to use some of the material you use. And, and that aspect is actually very exciting for me. Eric, maybe you, you've run workshops too. You, you might know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I, uh, I actually haven't. I've, done, I've been doing mentor sessions uh, this year. Uh, I've done oh, cool. uh, nearly a dozen now one-to-one -one, uh, sessions. But uh, this, this winter, I'm going to be launching my first workshop uh, in Chicago. I'm um, thinking about doing two separate ones, uh, one for creative portraiture uh, with photography, especially, especially for weddings, and, and then how to become a filmmaker if you're like already in the scene as a photographer because i know there's a lot of wedding photographers that want to get into filmmaking so it'd be a good class for those kind of people that's really yeah that's great i i'm keeping a question on that for later cool. uh if we have time we'll discuss it okay i think all right, so this is a very long answer to your very short question, but it's, it's so deep, uh, like it's literally impossible to rush 
through a question like that. There is so much history behind it. No doubt. So moving on, we're going to go to the next question, Eric. And the next question is, is from Luca. Oh, sorry. That was very French. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is from at Lucas.Savoy, S-A-B-O-I-E. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. It sounds very French, to be honest. <laughs> so Lucas is asking, what do I think about photography school? And I think um, I'm going to go first on that yeah. one, Eric. I'm going to let you pitch in after. Definitely. Photography school, I have no clue what you do in a photography school, if I'm very honest. So it's very difficult for me to judge. I know art schools here in France that are very famous, uh, and I have friends there, and they do a bunch of cool shit and a lot of art. Uh, they develop a lot their creative side, and I think they have a few classes around trying to sell your art or sell yourself as an artist. But my friend told me that people who make it actually just do everything on their own. And the school is more here to give you a structure or a place to develop your art and also the freedom maybe from the rest of society asking you what you do um, in order to make it. But if I'm honest, photography school, I've, I've never even considered it because um, maybe I'm a bit, I don't know, Uh, maybe my self-esteem is too big, but uh, too big. maybe my self-esteem is too big, but I strongly believe I could learn everything on my own. And if I, there was something I really needed to know, I could always go to a workshop or talk to a specific photographer for a specific skill. So um, I don't know, I would save my money and not go to school and just buy gear and travel and, and just learn on the, on the, on the field or work with a, Or just volunteer to work with a very good photographer and tell him, I'm just going to follow you everywhere and work for you for free for like a, a few months or a year or two and learn everything from him. And what, what about you, Eric? Did you even go to photography school or film school? I did not. And I pretty much agree with you on everything you just said. Um, having grown my business, like I said, in the fashion that I did, I'm a firm, firm advocate of doing it on your own in this field. Um, I've had multiple friends and acquaintances who went to school to get a bachelor's or master's in uh, photography and fine art photography. Um, and pretty much every person I've come across in that situation has said that it was worthless. And uh, not that it's a, a valuable experience and that you w wouldn't learn. Uh, I'm sure that's definitely the case. But I think a lot of those people look at the debt they went into to get that degree and see the success of the people around them in the field uh, who didn't do the same and are kicking themselves for it. Um, so, yeah, with the resources that we have today, I mean, YouTube alone, you can l yeah. literally learn everything you need to know. Um, and all the different options of workshops and online classes, uh, it's insane what you can get for uh the prices that you see whether it's literally free on youtube with tutorials or if you're purchasing an online class for you know uh anywhere from 500 to to three thousand dollars it's entirely worth it to get all of that knowledge um so yeah i think i think doing it on your own is is the way to go um and i know some people's personality is more they want to be in the education environment to do it um But I, th I, would, I would challenge those people to get out of their comfort zone and, and try it on their own. That's a good one. Yeah, and I think, uh, Lucas, if, if the question is for you, you really have to understand what are you trying to achieve with your photography. Who do you want to be? Do you want to be a, a photographer? What kind of photographer do you want to become? What kind of work do you want to do? Where do you want to live? And how do you want to live your life as a photographer? I think all that is going to be super interesting. You might want to be like a super artsy photographer that goes like super fine art, uh, just like super moody streets and do only art galleries and, um, and lives, lives that way. And maybe through Instagram prints and all that. I mean, selling print through, prints through Instagram. Or you might want to be working as a portrait photographer or landscape photographer. There's so many different options and depending on which one you will choose, It will give you a path. In my opinion, if you're trying to work in studios or with a lot of people, the best is to get exposed to that environment and go straight into studios and just walk for free to see how, if you like it or not. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, 
I think, yeah, the school, if I had to create a photography school, there would be no photography content in the school. <laughs> like, nothing. We would, there would literally be a class where it's like, there, there are cameras and you just take your camera and, and go live your life and bring it at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And all the classes would be around business, around um, maybe useful stuff, maybe like accounting, um, working with clients, how to deal with clients. All the business stuff, I think, are the most important one to learn mm -hmm. because the creative side is uh, you can learn very easily online nowadays. And you produce that creativity on your own and grow it and shape it on your own to create your own Exactly. Voice. Exactly. I mean, you could have a school that, that would be like, here's your ass assignment this week, come back next week, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> but people might not like my school because it would be very business-oriented at one point. Yeah. And they'd be like, what the hell? I just and then I'd be, be like, guys, I mean, you're not, you're not going to eat lenses for dinner, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's over overrated uh, for at least the creative field, I think uh, school is way overrated. And even more nowadays, mm -hmm. you have a huge opportunity of making it on your own and learning everything on your own, which is amazing. Yeah, it's wild, the resources that we have today to be able to sell things, to be able to get in front of people's eyes um, that are free. I know Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this a lot, you know, like using platforms like Instagram. This is literally a free app that you could broadcast and market yourself in so many creative and nuanced ways. Um, and so take full advantage of that. Get in front of people's eyes. Get, yeah. get creative as a business person um, and use those free avenues. We've, we've never lived in a time like this. That everything before the internet was paid advertising. And now you can literally advertise. Um, so go. This is crazy. This is crazy. It. Yeah, Eric, I'm going to cut you. But just before we, we go on the tangent, on the Instagram thing, my friend who is in art school, which is still good. Remember in France, university is free, guys. Mm -hmm. So it's, it makes sense to go there because you just have a place to chill mm -hmm. um, and work. My friend uh, has been two years, three years now into it. From the first year he started his Instagram with his art that he's painting and it's very abstract. I can tell you he's charging like $3,000 for prints, uh, not prints, but a canvas that he sells and literally ships worldwide. And it's crazy. The guy is like 22. Mm -hmm. And I was so, so surprised. And I'm like, that would have been impossible back in the days. Yep. So you have like zero excuse not to make it nowadays. Yep. If you don't make it, you don't want it enough and you're not patient enough. Mm -hmm. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> I know we just lost any everyone now they're like oh great <laughs> I feel like I lost my life no I'm kidding <laughs> alright so guys if you're still listening we've had the three questions of the day now I want to ask Eric Eric do you have a question for the audience maybe something that you would like people to think about next time they're going to shoot either for video or for photos maybe it can be a creative exercise go ahead shoot um, how, how can you challenge yourself to be more creative? How can you take some inspiration uh, that you already have, maybe a photographer or a filmmaker that you follow? And how, I'm not saying go copy them, but how can you take something that they do and put your own spin on it uh, to create something that is your own, uh, your own unique voice? And so uh, take, take one of those elements. I'm not saying plagiarize, but use something to just light a fire of creativity in you. Um, just brainstorm, write those things down, and then go out and try to execute it. You know what? I think I'm going to do it tomorrow morning. Yeah? Yeah, because I, I'm supposed to go shoot in the morning uh, around sunrise in Paris. I think I will I will try something like that. I think it's a good one. I didn't know what to do yet. I think you you just inspired me. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. You can find Eric. Eric, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube. If you just look up my name, Instagram's eric.floberg. And it's just my name, Eric Floberg, on YouTube. And guys, he's got some really good videos on YouTube. Um, I think the content's great. And it's, it's very, yeah, the few of the videos I've seen were really different. I, I never saw tutorials on that before. 
So don't miss out on that one, Eric. That was really cool, by the way. Thank you. Uh, the um, the funny portrait where like everything's blurry. I can't remember the name. Mm-hmm. It was really nice. Thanks. So guys, remember the concept of the podcast is very simple. You can ask questions, and I'm gonna answer them with awesome guests like Eric today. So if you have the Anchor app, please record a voice message so I can play it in the next episode, and then we're gonna answer the question. Otherwise, just hit me up on Instagram at Pierty Lambert or on Twitter at Pierty Lambert, and I will uh, include your questions if they're good. Oh, no, I'm kidding. I'm including a lot of questions, even if they're not good. There are no bad questions, guys. Don't be shy. Ask, ask away. Eric, I'm going to let you go now. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. When we will be in Chicago, we will do a sequel on that episode. So if you guys have questions for Eric, you can ask and uh, I'll ask him directly when I'm in Chicago. Sweet. Thanks for having me, man. I'm looking forward to meeting you face to face. Yes. Uh, and I can't believe I spent two months in Chicago um, in, the, in the cave thinking, God, there are, I only have one creative friend here. <laughs> I really need to find others. And then I discover you literally two Dang days it. after I leave Chicago. I'm like, <laughs> oh, really? Why? Uh, anyway, sorry. next time I'm in Chicago. All right, guys. See you later.